So I guess I'll have to ask someone I know to pass around the, the mic. Because as you may know or remember, this is an interactive talk. So we prepared some stuff to follow around, but we are really hoping to have a discussion, thoughts, and sharing experience. I guess it should almost be time to start. I don't know. All right. I guess you all agree that we'll now proceed. Okay, so the topic of, of this talk, as I just told earlier, is um, an interactive talk. So we're really hoping to share our experience. Um, why did you, we want to make this talk? This is Ramnes, I'm Ultraberg, and we work at Numberly. Uh, that's where you can find us if you want later uh, discuss things with us. Uh, but to get back on the title of this talk, um, it's about what happens when shit happens. Um, the main thing in our job, daily job, we run some pretty heavy throughput um, web services and that gather data for our customers. And we can never be down. Downtime is not acceptable, and losing data, which is another story, is not accept acceptable either. Um, so we've developed over the years some kind of um, practical uh, reactions, and we have learned to develop and design our infrastructure uh, a bit differently, and we are still learning. That's why it's an interactive talk, because we don't claim we have the answer for every use case. So we wanted to start with uh, the basic stuff, which will lead maybe, I hope, to the conversation we'll have. Let's take a simple example, which Guillaume will uh, introduce you to. So yeah, as Alex said, um, this is like a very basic application, like uh, what you could have when you start a company or anything. So you have Nginx, who serves HTTP requests. Behind that, you, you have a Flask application, who handles all, all the logic stuff. And you put all your data in a MongoDB database, for example, but really that could be like any database. Um, so first example is what's, what happens when your database is down? So in our cases, we have multiple solutions. So yeah. For example, the server could be burning. But um, if you have that, you can have just a replica set um, of databases. So if one burns, well, there are still two or three other databases I can take uh, the lead and, okay, uh, you continue to serve um, uh, requests. Um, something else that could happen is that you miss some resources. For example, uh, you don't have RAM anymore. So if you don't have RAM anymore, well, you could uh, trigger some automatic uh, kills, like with um, USG, for example, do that. Uh, you can just say in USG, okay, if uh, that process take more than, uh, uh, I don't know, like one gigabyte, okay, kill it. Um, you could use cgroups, uh, like with dockers or anything, uh, just to say, okay, this process just have that amount of memory. Um, if you don't have any disk anymore, like if the disk burn or if you have big failures, um, 
what could help is a red one, red 10, uh, anything. Um, basically, uh, never run in production uh, a web application on uh, something that doesn't have a red really. Um, another good thing you could have is a distributed file system, uh, like NFS or anything. There is a lot of things you could have. Um, this is a good idea for some use case. For some of the case, sometimes it can add some uh, other risk, but that's, um, that's a choice to take. Um, if you have a server overload, like the database can't handle any more requests because it's already like at its full throughput, um, well, there's not much you can do except monitoring it so you know what in what, when it happens and scaling horizontally so you are just add more servers so you can you can handle more requests so if you have like some um, some other ideas or some remarks about that don't hesitate to tell us about it like like Alex said it's really an interactive thing so go ahead and while you get the microphone I'd, l I'd like raise, uh, you to raise your hand if your backend database server already crashed your web service applications or anyway, <laughs> applications. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> all right. So I guess you all have experience in these fields. Like I said, we, we prepared basic stuff like this and we'll get deeper and deeper uh, in between the talk. So yeah, please. Yeah. Hi. So, uh, yeah, I think we all shared the experience. My question would be, why don't you use or did, didn't use um, any of the standard tools or solutions for those kind of problems? For example, uh, for the list here, Mesos seems to be a good solution. I can answer that. Um, for complexity say, sake, uh, who doesn't know Mesos? Okay, so we lost already a lot of, this, of, the, of the audience. So just to get back about what it is, it's, and correct me if I'm saying it wrong, it's a cluster service oriented, um, clustering service oriented uh, solution with resource management so that it can spawn a resource somewhere and spawn it somewhere else if the given server which, where it was running accidentally dies. Right. But setting up Mesos and managing it is an overhead that you may or may not want to, to, to have. Kubernetes is also the same kind of thing by Google. Google platform runs on Kubernetes and it's also a, maybe a good solution. Um, it depends on the architecture. Here, yeah, we took a basic example with no automation whatsoever. And because also we believe that um, sometimes simplicity is an, and built-in features of the technology we use are a better response to making a bigger infrastructure and adding, again, complexity. Maybe, maybe you can save complexity by using right technologies or technologies who handle failure in the right way. Uh, also, we won't talk about Mesos or Kubernetes in this talk, but this is really like the first example. In the next example, we'll go like on bigger architectures, so. Yeah, um, so. It is uh, my experience that uh, I heard a lot of similar responses from different teams. And um, the thing is, uh, sooner or later, um, they end with a lot, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. And um, sometimes, okay, really sometimes, it's perhaps cheaper to just use something and invest like a week or two instead of having to answer the phone at 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, it really depends on your team and the size of your team or your company. Mm, yeah, but I, I really agree with you. Uh, I just wanted to say, like, please don't call, like, plain NFS a distributed file system. Yeah. So it's just, like, use something like Gluster or... Yeah. Yeah, it will burn you. 
Yeah, you're right. When I when we wrote uh, distributed file system, we are more we have we had more in uh, in mind uh, HDFS, uh, which we use intensively. Yeah, it's a misspoke. Okay, uh, in my experience, it's not very hard to. Uh, 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 avoid uh, hardware failures. We have replication, we have uh, master slave, uh, we could uh, clone, backup our data, but it's very hard to recover logical failures. When we uh, logically corrupt our database or corrupt our MongoDB database, uh, and uh, how we could avoid this? Yeah, yeah, we'll. We'll cover maybe deeper which uh, example who relate to your to to the problem you you're, you're talking about. Yeah, but I I agree with you. That's only pure hardware failure. Here, any other hardware failure experience? Hi. So I forgot to mention that. Mostly with this kind of homebrew solutions, um, I noticed that um, they end up with a much more complicated architecture. For example, if you would want to somehow um, make now out of this technology stack uh, some fail-safe architecture, I mean, in my experience, teams have ended with multi-master, highly complex MariaDB clusters and whatever. And, uh, you know, the solution is simply use Celery, use Blah framework, just do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get some, some of, uh, of those afterwards, you're right. Um, yeah, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's continue on. I don't, know, I don't know if I'll be contributing much, but just an anecdote about hardware failures. Uh, on this one project that I was only briefly, we had this big data, data center in Verizon or Amazon or something, uh, but it was in one place in the world, and a tsunami hit. hit. We'll talk and about this later. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, so no, no, no. Keep on, keep on. But you know, then we thought up. Yeah, we have to have another one on the other coast of US. Sure. For stuff like that. Sure, sure, sure. Of course, we'll get to that as well. You just want to see me walking. Yeah. <laughs> That's because you said you were tired earlier. Oh, uh, no, actually, I'm, yeah, I was. Oh, no, or you're. No, actually, I was a little bit late because we were, I was stuck in the EPS meeting, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, these are all server things, but yep. if you have servers, just servers, you're not reachable, so the network is missing, and network mm -hmm. is a Thank big you. problem as well. Thank you. <laughs> also, hardware can fail there. Yeah. Very badly. Yeah. That's another possibility. Um, unreachable backends. Indeed. Uh, that's maybe what occurs most than a server burning, a burning server, actually. The first thing that comes to my mind with unreachable backends is a sysadmin guy who tripped over the cables, true story. I'm sorry, not me, not me, but anyway. The first thing is you have to make him remember. That's human behavior. Uh, so maybe find a forfeit for, for it, an Hello Kitty keyboard for one week, whatever you want, but you have to make him remember. On the hardware side, you can handle also switching and switch failure. The easy answer to this on Linux, for instance, but it also works on, on, uh, on Windows, is use network bonding. Now, when you buy a server, they have at least one network card with two ports. Use those two ports to, uh, to and, and plug them to two different switches. It's really easy to do. When you have a really real network, uh, network people, uh, you can do LACP, which is um, a higher but more resilient and more robust way to do the same thing, aggregating two ports and adding up their bandwidth while adding fault tolerance to your networking. 
That's the principle. Do you have any sharing knowledge about switch or unreachable things? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Is anybody using hardware anymore? Is not everyone running in the cloud or using virtual machines? And you're running it yourself? Yep. Okay, just asking. So yeah, we do it ourselves. So yes, we, we, we buy everything, we host everything ourselves. And so we have to take care of these kind of problems, yeah. And we use Gen2 in production. <laughs> yeah, we use Gen2 Linux in production, which maybe a lot of you haven't heard about. We are some kind of crazy people. When I say we're used to shit handling, maybe it's part true. Any other thing to share about network resiliency? Well, okay. Now let's get a bit uh, deeper in the stack. Uh, having a fail-proof stack can also help uh, when it's not about only the hardware part. On Nginx, there are two things I like to use mostly. Is that in Nginx, you can handle backend HTTP errors. Like your upstream gets back to you with a 500 error. What do you do? Do you pass back this 500 error to your client? Or do you try to handle it nicely? I'll show an example of this. If you don't know about this, it's called name location in Nginx. We use this a lot. So when something bad happens, you can see on the bottom error page, whatever you, it is. We will change the error code to 200 to mask it for the user while still serving some kind of um, pixel because this is a pixel service. And we can even handle if there was a redirect get parameter in the URL we can still redirect the user to the correct page, even if our backend didn't or made something terrible. So that's the kind of little trick location and error page uh, handling can really save you from facing, hey, 500 error uh, calls from your clients. And we use it quite a lot. You can also serve from cache, so Nginx has cache, caching capabilities. You can say, okay, if uh, I get an error code from my backend, I will just serve a stale cache response. It's pretty handy as well. On your Flask application, usually you can also use stale caching, which can be handy if your database uh, right, uh, is down uh, as well. You can have some answers in cache and serve from stale cache. It's better to answer something than an error code. And then you can have multiple um, techniques to not lose data. This is more focused on not losing data. Um, spooling and task deferral in, uh, in, in the basic way is the, is the way that you get some data from your HTTP call, and this data is very important to you. You don't want to be asking your client to send this data twice, even more when, in our case, it's navigation data, so it's uh, a browser and users browsing a website data. We can't have this data back. Um, spooling it means that whenever we have it, we are not forced to immediately insert it in database. We can take this data, write it somewhere on disk, and have another process be fitted with this data and insert it in a safe way. So if your backend is down, it just, it just, just can try and try on over and over inserting this data while it was a long time ago since you responded to the client. That's, that's, that's deferral. There are also message queuing technologies such as Maybe you heard about it already here, zero MQ, rabbit MQ, which is more resilient, um, and stuff like that that can help you get data and make him into a task. That's also the celery philosophy, which is, which is um, 
using RabbitMQ as a, as a message broker. The important thing here to me and to us is don't send back error codes to your clients, even if you, um, unless you really have to. Depends on what you're doing, but you can handle them even on higher levels of your infrastructure. And don't lose data. Don't ask your clients to send again this data. You have m ways and means to handle these kind of failures as well and to not ask for it. Do any of you use any of those techniques? Two, three, four? <laughs> what, what techniques do you use? Uh, hi, I used to work for a WordPress hosting company and uh, a lot of what we did was basically rely on uh, the reverse HTTP cache to a lot of the content being served is actually just uh, static content in a way. Like think of a lot of people running basically websites, gl those glorified blogs were basically just you know, static content after a while. Um, and then the backends could fail all the time and customers would never notice if you serve from cash, everyone's happy, the front page is up, the main articles are up, a lot of things are available, especially when your website is basically a content publishing platform, because that content doesn't actually change that much, it's not very dynamic, it, it works very well, I mean, you don't have to wake up every five minutes in the middle of the night during an outage, you can sleep through it and everything's fine, no one will notice, except the people trying to publish an article, if it's something really urgent, then the, yes, they will complain, but... <laughs> yeah. Any other users who want to share their experience of what they are sh using it for? Yes, to, to complete uh, this thing, even of, uh, on websites like e-commerce, uh, you can use similar techniques, even if you need a database actually to insert the orders or, or stuff like this, because like 95% of the content is static, so you can have something like Vanish serve the static content, mm -hmm. then use some tiny JavaScript to just get the little tiny part specific to the user, like the username, the name, the, the basket, and etc. And I've, uh, I've seen it used to like lighten a lot the, the charge on the, on the backend. And it, yeah, it's really effective. And even if you have like one or two minutes of uh, downtime for your backend, your user can still add, uh, navigate the website, see all the products, and may maybe uh, by the time they add to cart, uh, the backend will be back up and you won't lose yeah. any money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I guess the conclusion here is it's better to run a, even a degraded version of your website or whatever services it, you, it is you run than having it fully down. Depends on the use cases. Yeah. It can be argued. You want to argue it? <laughs> Come on, we are here for it. Yeah. I want to hear the counterpoint. Uh, for example, if you charge money from client, it's better to say, I cannot, than yeah. take money after uh, several hours. I guess even that can be argued. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> So the next thing you can do is, of course, clustering your application. So um, if one of your backend is down or one of your database is down, well, it's still working. Um, so the bad thing is even with a load balancer, there's still a single point of failure. So you can always go, uh, you can always get more uh, redundancy like it, even if you're, you have two load balancers and two apps, yes, then the whole data center can go down. So you have to get another data center. Um, so it's kind of an, an, an affinity loop, but yeah, redundancy is cool. Okay, so now we can get to your point where your data center burns. Yeah, this photo looks pretty bad. I don't know if it was shop photoshopped or it's a, if it's an actual photo, but I was uh, like, oh my God. 
I don't want the C to be the CSOPs coming back after the fire alarm in the, in the data center room. On the upside, actually, it's pretty simple. Have multiple data centers if you run them yourself. If you use the cloud, uh, like it's been subject, uh, su suggested, um, in Amazon, you have this, this um, notion of availability zone that you should use. Make sure you do remote backups, whatever you do, and test them. In France, we had a recent story where uh, a big company lost its customers' data and they, found, they thought that they had backups because they were using backups and remote backups, and when they tried to get them back up, yeah, it, I, it, can, it can be said, um, it failed. There again, I don't want to be the CSOPs over there, and you don't want to, I guess. Um, on the IP routing and connectivity stuff, you, you have BGP, Anycast stuff for having a single IP address accessible all over the, ro the world. Um, something I appreciate also is DNS health checking. So for this, we use Route 53. Uh, on AWS, I don't know, who, who knows about Route 53? Okay, not so much. It's a um, DNS service from AWS where basically you can have geo-distribution uh, based uh, DNS responses and add to those uh, DNS records the health checking. So if your data center or whatever happens uh, is down, one of your IP to your, um, to your web service is down, it will not be answers, answered from DNS queries anymore. It's pretty handy and cheap as well. On the application design, you have to think about geo-distributed applications, who runs at least one geo-distributed service here. Okay, so I'm not talking about too much people, but still, it's a very interesting thing to do. As a developer, it's a real challenge, and as an ops, it's a real challenge, even when you want this service or this kind of, um, when I say service, it can be a database service available all around the world. It's, uh, it's also, a nice, a nice thing to, uh, to try and achieve. Anyone had this kind of problem already? Where they were relying on everything in one place? Yeah? What happened to you? Uh, on the whole data center? Power. Yeah, so obviously I'm not an administrator of a uh, network of some kind, but I uh, was, uh, no, I seen this all. So um, our main uh, service was located in one data center and it failed uh, power. Um, and it ended up just in four hours of outage. Complete, nothing worked. Crucial infrastructure was located there. Cool. So we just uh, dialed up our clients and said we're sorry, nothing. And yeah. af afterwards, we afterwards we apparently distribute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What time did it take to distribute your the mm, whole the whole I, thing? I would have to ask my administrators. Yeah, but I know that certain steps were carried out. Yeah. You just add a little bit because um, just how easy terrible stuff can happen to a data center, especially if it's not like a big company, uh, they are like a small data center or a service provider having a small hosting area, because I used to work in a kind of the same environment, and basically so many things can go wrong. We had a story, uh, I, I mean, I won't name the company, but basically it happened overnight, and the night shift who was monitoring the object, just everyone fell asleep suddenly, hmm. and uh, they missed the, all the alarms, and basically when the morning shift came, uh, like uh, all the temperature in the server room where we had a lot of our customers hosting their services was like 70 degrees. And we opened all windows and starting, started just like, you know, to try to get some air there. But basically a lot of things can go horribly wrong, so choose your 
uh, data centers carefully and try to really get more of them if it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Contracts with your providers. One, one more. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm just relating oh, to, to, to the <laughs> contracts to your, con to your providers are not enough, usually. And even, even providers say like 99.9999% but not 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, uh, luckily this was a data center that was only used for the development, but um, we had an air conditioning that was running really hard and it leaked water into um, the power outlet that was behind the UPS. So no more <laughs> uninterruptible power supply. It w the proved that it was interruptible. Mm -hmm. uh, it was down for two days. Two day. well, yeah, it was a major, major problem. Yeah, you have to call your clients in the end. In the end. It's so I guess this, is, this must be very hard to explain. Mm -hmm. I don't want in to be in the sales department at this time. Um, the problem with geo uh, uh, separated uh, distributed uh, locations is not a pro when it goes down, yeah. but when things come up again. That's and right. I've had a few times where services came back up and we had both of them active because they couldn't see each other, but the rest of the world could either see one or the other. Yeah. And then people start using it and when, thi when they see each other again, then one of them has to decide to be slave again and weird things happen. Yeah, that's called the split brain situation <laughs> where your brain doesn't know anymore because you had usually two peers. That's why in clustering in general and in everything you should do is that always be at uneven numbers and you already know about the voting strategy, okay, if I am in a disconnected situation, who is down? I am or is my peer down? If you have only two peers, you have no way to know. You have at least to have three peers to be able to know. If you can't reach any of the two other peers, you are down. That's solid, pretty solid. It's not always solid, but it's pretty solid. At least always think in uneven numbers, always, whatever you do. Yeah, okay. So terror is great, but um, sometimes real world problems are a bit more complicated and it's not always like DevOps stuff. Uh, it can be like really coming from your code. That's what we are going to see. So uh, one day uh, I was working like normally um, doing my stuff and one of our market guys came and tell, told me, hey, Ram, as the client says he can authenticate on the server, on the website, something's wrong. Um, I was like, okay, I'm going to check the logs. This happened like maybe 10 times per day, so uh, okay, let's, let's see, maybe something's wrong. So I SSH to the machine, I, I look at the log, and everything's okay. So, well, the client is wrong. Whoop, what did I? So yeah, the client must be wrong. So he goes away and I'm happy. Uh, something like one hour later, uh, I'm still working and the guy come back and tell me that it's still not working for, uh, for the client. So I'm exhausted, uh, all right, I'll check the code, maybe something's wrong. Then uh, I look at my application and I see that. Does anything see something wrong? So after 30 seconds, I notice that the same email function can fail. So if the, the email function fail, well, it returns, okay, it works. So yeah. My conclusion to that story is that you have to know your code. Like, infrastructure is great, but code can fail too. Uh, 
even if you don't, don't like the guy who, who wrote the code, even if you don't understand the code, you, it's, it's, if you're a maintainer of something, you have to understand what you're doing and you have to refactorize when needed. Uh, error should never pass silently, that's from the Zen of Python, well. And yeah, don't always blame ops guy. Sometimes it's easy, like, okay, that's not my fault. It might be another server thing. So that's why the DevOps thing is great. So you can like really understand what's happening on your server, even if you're just a developer at the origin. Uh, and the other, the other way around is true too. So do any of you had similar situation? How did you, what, what kind of really weird things happen? Okay, now it's gonna be brave for developers to raise their hands here. <laughs> on yeah. a, I, I know. I, I had a silly situation where uh, a similar thing where I was saying, oh, the this isn't working for the client. She's trying to like do all these things. She should like, she had a really odd workflow. And so I was thinking, hang on, this is all working. All the tests are passing. I go onto the website and I'm looking thinking, this is all, this is all working fine. Um, and I ran all the tests and it's working fine. And what I didn't really realize, it took me like a week to realize where she kept on coming back to the point where um, like I use no script. So I'm happy using the HTML backend and everything so I can find. What I didn't realize was if you enable the JavaScript, JavaScript uses a different API and that's the thing causing the problem. So make sure to eat your own dog food and use your own API. That's like, <laughs> like that got, uh, yeah, it, it looked like it was working, but uh, I didn't write the code, so it's fine. Yeah, but in the end, you were responsible. Yeah, yeah that, that's, yeah. Hi. Uh, right in Python, we get used to the libraries we're using raising exceptions. Um, a really common one that doesn't is memcache. Pretty much every memcache library will return zero instead of raising exception. Um, so you need to wrap it or do something like that, but there's four or five places I can think of in different projects that we've been working on where we trace back something to like, why isn't anything working? It's because we think memcache is working when it's not. Yeah. I tend to like the memcache Python library because of this, but sometimes it can be a nightmare, yeah. So you have always to check about the, it's like the Go. It's like in Go, you have to check the year the return of the, of, the, of the operations you do. Right? Any brave, any other brave developer want to share about this? Oh yes, we have one here. Pass it, pass it through. Yeah, so my example is not related to Python really, but to PHP. Uh, yeah, I know. But, uh, but who I know. thinks it happens more in PHP? <laughs> That's brave developers. No, but <laughs> for my defense, I am not the one who wrote the code. Uh, but there is a very nasty thing when uh, you try to auto load some file class and you have a syntax error. Then, if you do not handle this properly, then PHP dies, returns, and the web server returns. Uh, blank page with uh, 200 okay. Ah. And okay. no other way to de debug this issue. That's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> we, we ended up at the WordPress hosting company where I work, we ended up writing some code in the reverse proxy that would detect these sort of situations, the white pages, and alert us to it, just because it's such a stupid default. Why would you return a 200 when something's wrong? And yeah, it's horrible to monitor for that. Wow. Uh, I have to mention Python break, uh, break itself this ruler. For example, uh, Hezator hides attribute error exception. And sometimes it's can make very strange things. <laughs> Two, I think. Switch to Python 3. 
Um, one thing that's, that's not related to Python or any programming language, really. Um, I was having a server with a pretty large disk in it. Um, and there were very, very, very many files on that. And then suddenly a developer called in and said, hey, I think the disk is full. So I go, look, do a DF, and no, it's not, not only 10% used. And he says, well, I can't write any files anymore. I says, okay, touch file, uh-uh, disk full. Yeah, it ran out of R nodes. Yeah. That's something. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nasty one. Yeah. That's the nasty one we, we, we often overlook. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And there are file systems who don't rely on inodes. So when you know that your application might spawn a lot of files, think about them. Indeed. I have another story that I forgot to put in the presentation. But, uh, so I'm going to tell it right now. <laughs> uh, basically, in my old company, like it was a small startup. Uh, before I worked at Numberly. So we were trying to, to get things fast. So basically our web server was running inside a Tmux. Um, and sometime when we looked at logs, uh, we were like just crawling on Tmux. And one day we were like, oh my God, this, the web server is not running anymore. And actually it was just Tmux. When you scroll, it sent a, um, a, a pose. It sent pose to to your application. So the application was down just because Tmux was, we were trying to check the log with Tmux. Don't run Tmux in production, that means. <laughs> <laughs> and about the DevOps philosophy, I don't know how, what kind of adjective we can add. Who works as a DevOps or in the DevOps minded company? I see, I don't know if you're waving to say hello or... <laughs> okay. Just wait, I come with a microphone. Because we can't understand you in the back. Yeah. Yeah, we should have thought of, about that a little, probably a little bit earlier. <laughs> The, the DevOps question is hard because uh, when your managers and everybody talks a lot about DevOps, but they hire a guy who is a DevOps <laughs> as a DevOps position, then, then it gets you know tricky. So you get back to the silo. So, so we are developers and the DevOps. So yeah, back to developers and ad sysadmins. I was actually a developer who had to run back to our admins to check up why the fuck is Docker not working again. Oh, the Elasticsearch containers cl uh, clustered with each other. Ooh, interesting. So in that sense, I was a DevOps because I, need, I needed to worry about the code and about infrastructure mess up. So yeah, it's a tricky word. <laughs> yeah, it has a different depth uh, depending on when you sta where you stand. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to a question, who runs Docker in production? And can you share some experience with it? I'm interested. And more, I'm more interested in when it's failing, obviously. Just one thing, we were actually doing uh, uh, just this new project, so, so it was more of a proof of concept, but we've already started to get it out to customers and we were working together with this uh, con consultancy who to told us how to do Docker and Cloud Foundry, if someone knows Cloud Foundry. So our whole infrastructure, uh, we would provide services for Cloud Foundry based on Docker, so you know, like Spawn Redis's, Elastic Searches, stuff like that. But the Docker cluster was actually one machine with all the containers for all apps for all services. So don't do that. Oh yeah, okay. Thank you. 
So I can share a funny story where um, the Docker daemon crashed on the CI server. So <laughs> you can imagine uh, having like 15 um, super highly paid developers who are just mixing the air. And it was also fun to debug because, you know, uh, who would have thought of it? Mm. Uh, yeah, but to uh, get to the uh, previous point, um, how much effort would it take to implement something like um, supervisor or whatever process that would monitor the daemon? Probably not much. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. Some we, some fa sometimes we are on own barriers, and we, yeah, I, I really agree with you. Just about the DevOps thing. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a buzzword, uh, except, except especially for recruiters. Um, but how we see it at Normally is really like not a single person being a DevOps, but really a team where you have, yeah, people who develop, people who make mobs, that's the, the thing here. Um, but just working together and understanding what the other is doing is just very important. Giving time also hmm. to a developer to acquire and helping him mm, understand what he's not used to do and it's a, yeah. Another real world problem, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so we have our statistic on Grafana, so it's a very nice board. Uh, one day I was looking at Grafana and I saw the, t the statistics. So it, it wasn't really important because it was um, really just the maximum processing time of one of our services. Um, basically the, the average processing time was still very low. So uh, we didn't really um, investigated the, the thing, but um, it stayed there for like, I don't know, maybe two, two or three weeks or even more maybe, I don't remember, but we never understood really what was happening with wh why the maximum uh, processing time was so high. And then one day, boom, like, what? <laughs> um, so my first idea when I saw that the graph was going so low is, oh my God, the service is down. <laughs> uh, actually, no, it was still running. Um, but what was happening is, so I searched for like um, one hour to understand what, was, what happened. And I, I, I ended uh, talking with one of the most ops guy in the team. And he told me, hmm, oh, that's strange because um, at that moment, I deployed a, an Ansible playbook on one of uh, on, on those servers, and so w we looked at the playbook. Uh, what was the difference? And the only difference uh, was in the etc host file. Uh, basically, uh, our DNS server was like uh, all the time queried at each uh, database in session. So sometimes it was just overloaded. So just putting. Uh, the, uh, the IPs of our database in the etc host file of each machine fix the trick. So, yeah, that was pretty weird. Go ahead, Pau. Sorry. Here. <laughs> well. yeah, sometimes some other stuff I have to And it's not just um, resolving the d database server. You would be surprised to see how many uh, code is reversing DN the DNS. So you have to not just forward, but also reverse uh, is uh, happening quite a lot. Yeah. yeah and that looks like this problem. <laughs> To be honest, we felt pretty stupid with this one as well. And this one is pretty interesting because two days ago you made a presentation about using console. So yeah. For, <laughs> sounds very contradictory. Something. Yeah, yeah. And the thing, the question is, have you tried to put a local 
Jimmy has cash, cash uh, I don't know, a bind nine, something like that, and a TTL around 30 seconds or minutes, something like that. Would it make the trick? Y yes, absolutely. What's, what's embarrassing with this is that we also lacked consistency in what we do. You know, on another type of infrastructure, we have local, cache, local DNS cache, mm -hmm. but there we didn't have it. And when uh, Guillaume says the ops people were working on the Ansible playbook, it's also to start um, normalizing all of these. So yeah, so maybe we think that we have something in production and it's running for so long that nothing can happen to it. And we tend maybe sometimes to forget about its resiliency or performance or just applying the latest of your knowledge uh, just for the sake that it's running, I don't care or I don't need to bother so much unless something weird happens. In this case, it was good news, you know? We were satisfied with this shitty uh, processing time. But on another type, on another type of application, it might be not so. So, so uh, I think that one good trick is to always profile your applications at least once. <laughs> and I was I recently used VMProf from PyPy guys, and it actually just slowed down my service ab ar ar at around five percent. So it's actually viable to just you know, switch one instance and check what actually your code is doing. So actually, in that situation, I profiled the code, and I didn't have the same results as Synod's Garfan as so that's, that's why I was like, what the fuck, like, it's not working as it should. And that's why like, it wasn't really important. So like I said, we just let it, let it go, and well, it was a good surprise when, when it was fixed. <laughs> We came up only with embarrassing examples, <laughs> so you feel more comfortable sharing with us. I have a comment uh, regarding uh, performance monitoring tools. Uh, you really have to configure it properly. We had a situation that uh, response time was, uh, average response time was between 30 and 60 seconds, and it was caused by uh, uploading files. <laughs> For example, Five gigabytes files was uploaded by a few person, a uh, few, few people, and, and uh, it increased the uh, average response time. I think the same kind of uh, problem. Sometimes uh, our, um, our metric server goes down, and then we think, oh my god, my application is down, but no, it's still running. <laughs> yeah. Who is, using, who is not using a metric system? Who doesn't do metrics on their applications? Who doesn't have this kind of graph? <laughs> Nobody. You all have it. <laughs> okay, you I see you again. <laughs> waving people. Question. Yeah, yeah. 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 Question. I was precisely going to ask this tension of this kind of question. Have you managed in the end to put in the graph in Grafana some kind of percentile graphing so you can know a 90%, a 90%, percent, 5% percentile, and 99% percentile of the t response time. So you will know some kind of problems. Mm, yeah, we yeah. have been trying, we have having hard problem with this. In the end, we are deploying Prometheus plus Grafana, and using that with Elasticsearch on Influ, we are having a lot of trouble to really calculate the 99% percentile, the 95% percentile, but have you managed to s do this? Um, basically, we just, so um, what we use in general is a comparison between um, the current day and the, the day seven days ago. Mm -hmm. So it gives a good idea to, I is it normal or is it weird? And in using carbon and, and, and Grafana for the, for the visualization, you also have the um, annotation um, feature, which is good, where you can have a bar on your graph saying, okay, I, and you can plug it to your deployment or continuous delivery stuff. So you can have a bar on your graph saying, okay, from this point on, this is version 2.1. Uh, 
And then you can do also matrix comparison uh, related to code deployment. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. In disaster recovery, it's also a good thing to have. Uh, so when you know then you broke something and you can do the same with server provisioning and deployment. This, at this time I added a new server. Maybe it has some weird um, side effects. Side effects, yeah. Um, for the percentiles, if you mentioned you've already got Elasticsearch, if you don't have aggregates but have the actual requests logged there, uh, you can just use Kibana because it has a really nice visualization. If I recall, it gives you the percentages, the percentiles as well. I think you should get that for free from Kibana. The problem is to combine it with Grafana. The answer is the problem is to combine it with Grafana for the remote audience. Did anyone come with a question? I guess we have. Yeah, five yeah minutes we have left. four minutes Three, left. Four minutes left, yes. so open discussion now. Question. Okay, this is tricky. Uh, I'm looking to know if Edmai has an, some experience with um, trying to. Um, deploy a new version of your uh, backend and only deploy it to, let's say, 5% of your users, try it out, see how it handles, and then go for 100%. Especially Nginx, if you do Nginx, that's w that would be great. So pro progressive deployment. Anyone? Thank you. Well, yes, for the same company I was talking about uh, a bit sooner, about the e-commerce, we were always uh, rolling up the traffic, but it was with HA proxy uh, in front of, let me not tell you, I think it was HA proxy, then Varnish, then Nginx in, the, in that order. And uh, like the new servers were rolling up like 10% traffic on the new version. Then we had the software error monitoring and the uh, and all the metric on this server, we were checking that uh, like the response time was not uh, doubling, etc. And after a few hours, a few more servers were joining, and uh, at the end of the day, all the traffic was rolled up on the... I don't know if that answers the question. Depending on your stack, I can relate. We do um, a lower level of this, and we, we run our Python using USG. And in USG, you have this feature where you have it's called touch chain reload, where your workers are reloaded one by one after, and, and USG will make sure that the one that is reloaded, reloaded correctly before reloading the others. So it's a good fail safe, low level uh, deployment um, uh, trick. And, and on a yeah. side note, if you are really, really committed to trying canary releases, which is usually in a canary release when you put the bird and try to mine or if it's poisonous, try Kubernetes that resolves this problem in a very reliable way, but it's obviously very, um, it may be um, too much complicated for your case, mm -hmm. but it, it has exactly this kind of procedure. When you say, I have a rolling deploy strategy when I want to keep in mm -hmm. a number of pods, which is your application deployed, and in an hour, put it began to increase the number. Yeah. Kubernetes, yeah. This, this feature in Kubernetes is very nice, yeah. But Kubernetes still doesn't have else check, right? Kubernetes still doesn't have else check, right? Yeah. Health check. So, yeah. Oh. Okay. Great. So yes, it has. Okay, thank nice. you. So okay. that was one of the really bad things that allowed us to to go to Kubernetes. Okay, mm. great. Readiness check. That's right. Thank you, Paul. Yes, uh, I uh, want especially thank you um, because uh, this is like an interactive format and uh, it's a little experiment. Just like to have not to have only like one-sided talks, just like to have a on the direction. I want to thank you for like uh, taking a leap of faith in the first year we tried this. So I think uh, please give these guys an extra hand, please. Thanks. Yeah, and 
Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah, lightning talks up at five. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.